All right. Um, <clears throat> so today we're picking up um, on talking about this paper by Allison Miller and Lisa Piccarillo, um, where they disprove a conjecture by Akbalut Kirby that was already disproved by Abe and Tongue, right? I don't. I don't remember exactly. Um, I think Yasui was the original. Okay. One. Yeah. But in, in disproving this Akbalut Kirby conjecture, they came up with sort of a refinement of the conjecture. And so really what this, what this Miller Piccarillo paper is doing is disproving this refinement. Um, and they use Hagar floor homology specifically, they use correction terms, which is a numerical invariant associated to with spin C3 manifold um, coming from Hagar floor homology uh, to, to disprove this conjecture. Um, so here will be an outline of the talk. First we'll review the topological setup of what we're actually talking about. Um, since we'll need to compute some correction terms, we'll just give a brief review of Hager Fleur. Um, and we'll start getting ourselves in a position to make the computation, and then we'll make the computation, um, and then we'll close by studying this interesting family of knots that that comes up um, in our dis in this disproof of this conjecture um, okay questions before I get started all right um, so here's a conjecture there's I think there's somebody else on this attached to this conjecture um, but I forgot and didn't bother to look it up sorry um, so the conjecture is that if K and K prime are knots in S3 that have diffeomorphic zero traces, then up to the orientation of either knot, they are smoothly concordant. Um, very shortly after this conjecture was issued, Miller and Piccarillo uh, proved that there exist infinitely many pairs of knots with diffeomorphic zero traces, yet are distinct in smooth concordance even up to reversal of orientation. And this, will, this is the main result that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so this result is used, or is obtained by studying dualizable patterns that we've been talking about for, or that's been on our consciousness for the past couple weeks. Um, and they study dualizable patterns to construct pairs of knots with diffeomorphic zero traces um, but that we can distinguish, again, I'm just retreading old ground here, we can distinguish these knots by appealing to some Hagar floor homology of their branch double covers. Um, so let's just recall a uh, pattern in a solid torus is dualizable. Um, if there's another pattern in another solid torus, um, that's orientation preservingly homeomorphic to the pattern or whose exterior is orientation preservingly um, homeomorphic to the exterior of the pattern that we started with um, subject to these constraints and really what these constraints are are saying um, heuristically is that if I have a pattern in a solid torus and I look at it, its exterior that three manifold has two torus boundary components. Um, one component is coming from the solid torus that we started with. The other component is the neighborhood, or sorry, is the boundary of a regular neighborhood of the pattern. What these constraints say is that when I have a homeomorphism from the exterior of P to the exterior of P star, basically what's 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 going on is the roles of the boundary of the solid torus and the boundary of the pattern um, are being exchanged. Um, so that's what it means to be dualizable. In particular, um, this is the dualizable pattern that is used to construct these examples that disprove the conjecture. Um, so anytime you see J, this is the pattern that's being referred to and it's dual j star is tau minus four of j 
um, this tau minus four. So if I have tau in of a pattern, um, that just means take the pattern in the solid torus and then apply in Dane twists around the meridian. That's gonna preserve the solid torus, but it'll just add full twists in a particular direction um, into this pattern that we're starting with. So tau minus four of J is you take this pattern and you perform four Dane twists in the negatively oriented meridional direction. Um, and that's, that's the pattern that we're talking about. Um, okay, so the knots that we'll be considering, here's a basic template for the knots. Um, we'll parametrize big K by a little k, and so KK is going to be this knot that we get by starting with the pattern J and applying 2K minus one Dane twists um, around a meridian of the solid torus that it lies in. And it'll be convenient for us to have a surgery description of this knot in S3 um, to realize, right, if I, if I do plus one surgery on this unknot, on this blue unknot, and I do minus one over 2K surgery on this red unknot, I get back um, S3. And the image of this black curve is going to be this, it's, it's, it's this knot right here. So this is just a surgery description of S3 that takes this unknotted black circle, um, and it's, it's unknotted to this knot right here, where it looks unknotted in this diagram, but really it's this knot. Um, and we'll rely on surgery descriptions to be able to make the computations that we need to make. Um, but this is a template for the knot K. <coughs> right, so the knot K will be this knot, and the knot K prime um, will be, oh shoot, um, sorry, that's a mistake. That should be, right here, this should be T minus 2K minus 3 of J of U. Um, so instead of doing 2K minus 1, full twists right here, we're doing minus 2K minus three. Um, and so if you, if you just work out, if you just work out the arithmetic here, it turns out that um, this not K prime is, or the pattern T minus 2K minus three of J is dual, is the dual of, of this pattern right here. Um, so by a result covered in section, three or four of the paper, um, just by construction, these two knots, K and K prime, have diffeomorphic zero traces. Um, so that's our starting off point. So we have our two knots with diffeomorphic zero traces, um, and we're gonna use Hagar floor homology to distinguish them in smooth concordance. Um, since we're gonna use Hagar floor homology, let's review some basics. So if I have a three manifold equipped with a spin C structure, um, then I get a finitely generated module over some F2 algebra, uh, depending on whatever flavor of Hagard floor homology I'm taking, which can be either infinity, plus, minus, or hat. Um, but this is an invariant of a spin C three manifold. And they're just a, a number of different flavors that this homology group comes in. Um, the set of spin C structures on a three manifold is non-canonically isomorphic to the second cohomology of the three manifold. And by, so I guess Y is closed and orientable. So by, um, or we're, we're only dealing with closed orientable three manifolds. Um, so the second cohomology is isomorphic to first homology by Poincaré duality. Um, basically what's going on here is that you can show that the set of spin C structures is an affine space over second cohomology pretty directly. Um, so it's convenient to think about spin C structures in terms of their um, representatives in second cohomology after you, after you pick some isomorphism. 
Um, so if T is a torsion spin C structure, that means if it's, if it's associated element in second cohomology is, is a torsion element, um, then the plus version of this group admits an absolute Q grading. And it's this Q grading that allows us to define this numerical invariant of a spin C free manifold. Um, it's just taken to be the minimum grading uh, in the support of the uh, group HF plus of YT. Um, now the HF plus of S3 is what's called a positive tower. Um, and it's, it's isomorphic to this group right here. Um, this is the model group. The, the thing associated to S3 should be the model for any theory of three manifolds. Um, and we have that the correction term of S3, D of S3, is equal to zero. Um, so one way to think about what this invariant is, is it's, it's kind of measuring how far off from S3 um, this group is. Uh, because for a general three manifold um, with a torsion spin C structure, this group will have a lot of features that resemble this group. Um, and we'd like to know, you know, how far off, how far off from S3 this Q grading gets us. Um, so it's called a correction term or a D invariant. Um, now, Haggard floor homology is functorial. So that means that if I have a cobordism of three manifolds, then I actually induce um, a homomorphism of their associated Haggard floor homology groups. Um, and in particular, if I have a spin C cobordism, so that's topologic or smoothly um, a cobordism from Y0 to Y1, but I equip this four manifold with a spin C structure that restricts to the spin C structure S0 on Y0 and S1 on Y1, um, then I get a homomorphism uh, from HF plus of Y0 S0 to HF plus of Y1 S1. Um, and so this allows us to compare the associated D invariants um, of these homology groups if uh, W is particularly nice, if this four manifold is particularly nice. What do I, be, what do I mean by nice? Um, oh, typo, sorry. Um, I hope that doesn't obstruct interpretation. Um, so if I have a cobordism W from Y0 to Y1, um, and Y0 and Y1 are both rational homology three spheres, uh, then for any spin C structure on W, I get these inequalities or, or, or an equality um, in the case that W is of a particularly nice form. Um, right, so I get, I get this inequality if W is negative definite. I get this inequality if W is positive definite. And I actually have a quality of D invariance if um, Y, sorry, if W is a rational homology cobordism. Um, and so these, well, I'll, I'll explain this a little. I'll explain what these terms mean a little bit later for those who aren't familiar with them. Um, okay, so this is the theorem that we're going to, this is a big theorem that we're going to leverage to make some computations. Okay, um, so with the preliminaries out of the way, are there any questions before I move on? Okay, good. Um, so now I'll, I'll outline how we're going to prove that these two knots, K and K prime, with diffeomorphic zero traces, are not smoothly concordant. Um, so there's a standard argument that if K and K prime properly bound an annulus in S3 times I, 
then the branch double covers of K and K prime are rational homology cobordant. Um, what you do is you take S3 times I and you take the branch double cover of this four manifold along the annulus. Um, and then that, that four manifold will have rational homology, it'll, it'll be a rational homology S3 times I, no. Not sure exactly what it'll be, um, but its boundary components will be the branch double cover of K and the branch double cover of K prime. And it'll be a rational homology cobordism between these two branch double covers. Um, so that means that means in our case that these the D invariants of these two free manifolds for all their spin C structures are going to have to be the same because they're going to have they're going to have to be um, sorry. They're going to have to be rationally rational homology cobordant. So by this theorem, they're going to have to be the same. Um, okay. Um, so to actually show that they're not the same, we're going to have to look at, um, well, we don't, we don't have to, but the method that Miller and Piccarillo used was by being able to compute these D invariants by looking at surgery descriptions for um, these branch double covers. Um, and then from considering these surgery descriptions of the branch double covers, uh, what falls out is, an is a series of inequalities relating um, all of these correction terms as K varies. Uh, and that'll allow us to establish um, non-equality between the D invariants of these two free manifolds. Um, so here's that picture that I that I showed earlier. This is the not k sub k. Um, here it is standardly embedded in S3. Uh, here it is embedded in a wonky S3 um, where it appears in this diagram to be an unknot. So we're going to manipulate this diagram to get uh, a surgery description of the branch double cover of K. Um, so after, after isotoping to get sort of a standard looking unknot presentation for our knot K sub K, um, we end up with a diagram that looks like this. So this black curve is our K. This red curve is our eta, and then this blue curve is our gamma. And we haven't changed any of the surgery coefficients. Um, but notice, notice here that eta is actually a meridian. It appears as a meridian for, um, for our not K. Um, so that when we pass to the branch double cover, which is described in this diagram right here, um, the pre-image of the meridian and the branch double cover of S3 along the unknot is just a single simple closed curve. So it only, it only lifts to, um, to a single component, whereas this gamma, because of the way that it links with our unknot that we're taking the branch double cover of, um, it actually lifts to two different components. Um, and so from the standard S3 picture to the branch double cover picture, the surgery coefficient changes um, for eta, but not for the of gamma. Um, so basically there's a, there's, there's a, there's a it's not exactly a game, but there's a way that you can get this picture from this picture as a surgery description of the branch double cover of a knot by just, um, you know, taking, you know that the branch double cover of the unknot is S3. So what you can do is you can just 
take this link consisting of gamma and eta um, and see what it lifts to in the branch double cover of the unknot. Um, but then you have to go back and check out what, what your surgery coefficients are so that you get the right three man, you, you know, you get the proper description of the branch double cover of this knot K that you started with. Because even though it looks like an unknot right here, um, this is supposed to be an un, uh, a non-trivial knot. Um, but anyway, um, this right here is going to be the thing that we look at um, in order to compute some D invariants. Um, okay. So for k equals zero, note that um, y sub k has surgery description just given by, um, sorry, so it's, right, y sub k is, is the three manifold that I'm calling the branch double cover of k sub k. Um, so k equals zero, y sub k has surgery description y1 tilde union y2 tilde because if k is zero, then I'm just doing infinity surgery on this knot right here, so I might as well ignore it. Um, now the linking matrix for y1 tilde union y2 tilde is the identity matrix, is the square identity matrix of rank two. Um, and so the linking matrix of any, of any framed link is going to be a presentation matrix for the first homology of the three manifold that you get by performing these surgeries. Um, so this tells us that Y0 is an integer homology sphere. Okay, that's good, that's good to work with. Um, but now note also that actually for any K, this manifold YK is going to be an integer homology three sphere. Um, because we have a null homologous knot, eta tilde, in an integer homology three sphere. We're doing minus one over K surgery on it. So uh, just a standard Meyer via Torres computation um, says that all of these three manifolds are going to be integer homology three spheres. Um, so, right, we want, we want to be able to use the functoriality of Hagard floor homology um, we can't build a cobordism by performing minus one over K surgery on a knot, um, but we can actually we can actually expand this surgery on eta, eta tilde, um, by by Rolfson twists, so that we get a surgery description of a cobordism from y zero to y K, and that looks like this. Um, if you haven't seen the Rolfson twist trick before. Um, in this particular example, if you have um, minus one over K surgery on a knot, you can realize this surgery as integral surgery on a link um, by first performing minus one surgery on the knot that you started with. And then you need to chain together K minus one uh, minus two framed unknots um, in order to achieve minus one over K surgery. Um, so the upshot of this surgery description is that we can actually realize a cobordism from Y0 to YK by just thickening up Y0 and then attaching these two handles, uh, these four dimensional two handles um, along these framed knots or along this framed link. Um, and so, the four manifold that we get by doing this was it's called the trace of surgery. And one boundary component is the three manifold that we started with. The other boundary component is going to be the result of doing just, oops, just Dane surgery um, according to this diagram. Um, and that's the manifold that we care about, white K. Um, so when you, the second homology group of this four manifold is going to be important for computing these D invariants. Um, so let's just take a minute to get a handle on what's really going on here. Um, so we'll let SI denote the core of the ith two handle 
union a null homology of the ith component of this framed link. So this is the first component, this is the second component, third, all the way up to kth. Um, so for a given i, let's say i equals two, first we'll take this, um, the core of this two-handle attachment, and then we'll glue that to a disk that this knot bounds in the three manifold that, we, that we're starting with, Y0. Um, that'll be a closed surface, and it'll actually be non-trivial in homology. Um, and we do that for all of these components in our link. And what we get actually is that all of these SIs generate um, second homology of this four manifold WK. Uh, which is uh, nota bene isomorphic to z to the k. Um, but the second homology group comes with a symmetric bilinear pairing. If I have two homology classes, then I, I, get, I get a symmetric bilinear pairing by taking the oriented algebraic intersection number of two representatives for those surfaces. Um, and since, since we're intersecting two-dimensional things and a four-dimensional thing, this is, this is a symmetric, this is a symmetric pairing. Um, and it's bilinear because of the way homology works. Um, so we can talk about the pairing matrix for this, for this pairing, for this form. Um, we'll call it QK for the manifold W. And we can... We can look at this matrix with respect to this basis of SIs that we've picked out. And actually this pairing matrix can be written down just by figuring out what the linking matrix of this surgery diagram is. And that's pretty easy to write down um, because you have K components that are at most linked to two other components. Um, and they only have linking number one with any other component. So this is really easy. This form is really easy to handle um, and get a hold of. Um, so the pairing matrix with respect to the basis of SIs that we've chosen looks like this. Um, and if you play around with this a little bit, it's actually not hard to show that this this lattice, this rank k lattice with with form qk uh, is actually isomorphic to the standard negative definite euclidean lattice or the, the, st the standard negative definite unimodular diagonal lattice um, this is sort of easy enough to get a handle on but by realizing this isomorphism we have we know exactly what this work with this a lot more easily to do our, our correction term computations. Um, so what do those look like? Well, um, so we noted earlier that all of these YK are integer homology spheres. So they all have unique spin C structures. So they, they all have unique correction terms. And so we'll abuse notation by just omitting or suppressing the spin C structure from um, notation. Um, okay, so the C1 that showed up earlier associates an element of second cohomology of a four manifold to any complex vector bundle. You can realize spin C structures on a four manifold as complex vector bundles. Um, so we'll just restrict this, this first churn class map, C1 to the set of spin C structures on our four manifold. Um, <clears throat> so C1 of a spin C structure is an element of second cohomology, but not just any element of second cohomology, it's a very special element called uh, a characteristic covector um, for this inner product space, H, or H lower two of WK. Um, So 
what does that look like for us? We're working with this rank K lattice with, with standard um, pairing. And so we'll, we'll need to pick an orthonormal basis first. And then the set of characteristic covectors in this, in this lattice are just all of the vectors um, whose coordinates are odd, who, uh, all of whose coordinates are odd. Um, and since WK is negative definite, right, its intersection form is this negative definite lattice, um, then statement one from this correction terms theorem that I cited earlier tells us that for all spin C structures on W, D of YK is at least D of Y0 plus the self pairing of the first turn class of the spin C structure plus the second Betty number of the four manifold all over four. Um, all right, so this is the relevant inequality. Um, we've seen before that the second Betty number is equal to K. Um, and from the last slide, by understanding what characteristic vectors in our form look like, we know that for any spin C structure associated to some vector, um, all of whose coordinates are plus or minus one, this C1 of S squared term evaluates to minus K. Um, so changing what needs to be changed, we also get this left-hand inequality in the following proposition. It's listed as proposition 5.3 in Miller-Picarillo. So if KK and YK is above, um, for all K in the natural numbers, sorry, this should be D of Y sub minus K. Um, I should fix that typo for next time. Um, so the D invariant of Y zero is in between the D invariant of Y minus K and Y K for all K in the natural numbers. Um, Moreover, I omitted a proof of this because it didn't seem particularly relevant. Um, proposition 5.4 in the paper implies that this set of D invariants is non-decreasing in K. Um, so we're monotonically increasing. We might, not, we might not increase from one K to the next, but we're definitely not decreasing. Um, so that's an, that's, that's an important observation. Okay, so now we'll show that the D invariant of Y zero is minus two. So when K is zero, as I noted before, the surgery coefficient on eta tilde is infinity. Um, so we can just remove, we can just ignore eta tilde when we're, when we're looking at this diagram. And if we blow down along um, gamma two tilde, which is a Kirby calculus manipulation, um, the, the resulting diagram that we get actually realizes Y0 as one surgery on the knot 5-2 in S3. Um, and there's a theorem of Oshvath and Savo, and I'm sorry, I think I got one of the directions on those accent marks wrong. Um, but anyway, there's a theorem on correction terms of surgeries on alternating knots. And as a result of this theorem, we can explicitly compute that the D invariant is minus two. Um, so to show that D of Y1 is equal to zero, uh, we'll actually manipulate a different diagram for this knot K1. So this is what the knot K1 looks like. Here's a surgery description. Um, here's a surgery description where the knot K1 appears as an unknot. If we do the branch double cover trick, we get this surgery diagram for the branch double cover. Um, or maybe we don't, sorry. Basically, uh, the, the key point here is that this is a surgery diagram for the branch double cover. Um, but the, just the three manifold that this describes is the same as if instead of attaching two zero framed one, or sorry, two zero framed two handles, if we instead attach, attach a one handle 
and a two handle according to this knot and this framing, um, we get the same manifold. We get the same three manifold. Um, and so the bottom right Kirby diagram presents an algebraically canceling pair of a one handle and a two handle. Um, so that tells us, in fact, that Y1 bounds an integer homology ball. And an integer homology ball is a rational homology cobordism from S3 to the boundary. Um, so by, by this correction terms theorem from earlier, that tells us that the D invariant of Y1 is equal to the D invariant of S3, which is zero. So we'll summarize here the main result. Um, so D, remember this D of Y prime was, was K sub minus, it was a negative number and Y corresponded to a positive number. But here this corresponds to the term y, uh, D of Y zero, this is D of Y one. So we know for a fact that um, these two D invariants are different. So they're not rational homology cobordant. So K and K prime are not equivalent in smooth concordance. And actually, we never fixed what our little K was. Um, so by the generality of this construction, we actually get for free, you know, an infinite family of counterexamples to this conjecture that we, that we set out to disprove. Um, any questions about what's been going on so far? I just have one more slide about section. So, th so this, is, this is what goes on in section five of the paper. I have one slide left about section seven where they just say, by the way, there's also a lot of really interesting stuff about this family of knots that we've described. Um, but if I'd like to pause for maybe some digestion or, or uh, some questions. I've kind of forgotten. Can you remind me what Y is exactly? What Y is? And Y prime. Ah, sorry. So Y, yeah. Y is the branch double cover of this knot K. Let me go back here. Yeah, I was less than explicit with the notation. Um, so Y is the branch double cover of this knot, and Y prime is the branch double cover of this knot, um, which doesn't look like a knot, but it's supposed to, it's supposed to say a knot. Um, and the thing to notice, right, is that this, this coefficient is positive, this coefficient is negative, so the D invariant of Y is bounded below by um, the D invariant of zero, sorry, the D invariant of Y1. The D invariant of Y prime is bounded above by the D invariant of Y zero. Um, and that's, that's what's going on with this, with this equality, or sorry, with this inequality right here. Okay, well, if there aren't uh, any more questions, here's an interesting family of knots. Um, we'll look at this pattern J and just apply all these Dane twists in the solid torus to it. Um, and see, see the, look at this family of knots that we get. So we know we can compute, or at least, Miller Piccarillo can compute with explicit ciphered matrix computations what all of these Alexander polynomials are. Um, and by observation, all of these 
you know, the, the Alexander polynomial of the n prime knot in this family is different from that of the n knot in this family, unless n prime, ah, uh, sorry, that should say, this is an n prime, unless n prime is one of either n or minus four minus n, um, in which case this knot is the dual of this knot. Um, Alexander polynomial is an invariant of the zero surgery of a knot. Um, we know that these two knots have homeomorphic zero surgeries, so we know that they have the same, the same Alexander polynomial. That's for n equals n and n prime equals minus four minus n. Um, <clears throat> but even though all of these Alexander polynomials are different, for any pair of integers in an n prime, there's some integer r where the r trace of tau nj is diffeomorphic to the r trace of tau n prime j. So there's some, like, these are all different knots, but for any pair of knots, they share some r trace. Just strange, it's, it's simply left as a remark. And why um, that? Is it? What's that? Reason obvious? It follows from um, <coughs> it follows from some observations in section or some propositions and lemmas in section four, um, which was not in the uh, not on the curriculum for this talk. Um, okay. Since I thought it would distill, or sorry, it would take away from just talking about d invariance. Um, but yeah, this this follows from. Uh, a proposition or theorem or lemma in section four. Um, and actually, for any n, there's at most one s such that the s trace for tau n of j is not diffeomorphic to any of the other S traces for all of the knots in this family. So most of the time, the S trace of a knot in this family is diffeomorphic to the S trace of some other knot in this family. Um, additionally, uh, all of the four genera in this family are one. And for all distinct pairs of knots in this family, um, the four genus of K connect some minus J is at most one. Um, and all of these things are really just sort of stated as remarks. They prove this in some cases at the end of the paper, but I didn't, I didn't want to go through the details. It's in the paper. Um, so not only does this family of knots give us uh, counterexamples to this conjecture about diffeomorphic zero traces and smooth concordance, um, there, uh, there, there seem to be a lot more, there are many other interesting things going on with this family. Um, and that's, that's all I've prepared. I think 